today's Artist Encounter. Uh, we're thrilled to have you. Um, you, of course, make the work at the Goodman possible by, with your support and by attending. Uh, there's also a, a great uh, group of sponsors that have made this production and this event possible, and I wanted to first uh, start off by acknowledging them. Uh, the Goodman Theatre Women's Board is our major production sponsor. The Edgerton Foundation gave us the New American Award. Mayor Brown, our, our corporate sponsor partner, Time Warner Foundation, lead supporter of New Play Development. Elizabeth F. Cheney Foundation, major supporter of New Play Development. The Davy Foundation, major supporter of New Work Development. The Glasser and Rosenthal Family, supporter of New Work Development. <coughs> Harold and Mimi Steinberg, charitable trust, supporter of New Work Development. The Joyce Foundation, principal supporter of artistic development and diversity initiatives. And finally, American Airlines, the official airline of the Goodman Theater. Thank you to all of them. Uh, a couple of things. Today's talk is being live streamed on HowlRound TV. That's HowlRound.tv. And so uh, that is what the technical equipment is here that you're seeing. Uh, because of that, uh, we do have microphones. And so when we get to the uh, question and answer portion of the session, if you would like to ask a question, please step up to the microphone. We have two available that will be put out at that time. Uh, thank you. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, on my left, Director Robert Falls. Uh, playwright Rebecca Gilman, and finally I will turn it over to our moderator, Steve Edwards. Enjoy. Adam, thank you so much, and thanks to all of you for being here, especially on this frigid afternoon. I think that uh, those of you here in person with us deserve an extra round of applause compared to those who might be comfortably watching We're from the fireplace <laughs> on the live stream. Um, how many of you, by chance, have had a chance to see Luna Gale yet? I know we're just early in the morning. Oh, actually, a fair number of you, more than, than I would have expected. So that's great. Um, what we'll try to do for those of you who haven't seen the play yet is talk about it in a way that will inform your viewing experience and provide additional context, but won't spoil anything for your time when you actually sit and see the performance in person. Um, for those of you who ask questions later on, uh, keep that in mind as well. That not everybody has seen what you've seen. I had a chance to see it last night and uh, thought it was phenomenal. And one of the things I, I was looking forward to was a chance to be able to talk to both Bob and Rebecca about this. Um, in part because of the themes that, that it evokes in this play, not just the basis in the child welfare system, but themes around judging, themes around faith, um, around perseverance, etc. But I want to begin with the two of you before we go to the play 
by talking a little bit about your collaboration. This is now, what, this is your fourth production? This is the fourth production we've worked on together and the seventh that we've done at the Goodman uh, with Rebecca. And you wrote in the, sort of your notes in the program that you say, you know, that you've had the chance obviously to work with a number of playwrights and, and work on the works of, of many others. And you say, but there's none whose work I admire more than that of Rebecca Gilman. Bob, why do you admire her work so much? I find in Rebecca's work, um, well, just an extraordinary uh, sort of passion and, and social engagement, which I think is very unusual in, in contemporary writing, uh, that, that she has the ability, which very few writers do, uh, to sort of intermingle the personal, that, that the characters that she creates are extraordinary, uh, identifiable, very flawed human beings, as, as great characters and dramas should be. But there's a political sense uh, in all of her writing, where she's writing uh, often about social circumstances, social systems that people exist in, that's impossible to separate them from the environment they exist in. Uh, and this goes back to um, the first play that we commissioned at the Goodman, Spinning into Butter, which takes place in a university situation and involves a case of racism on college campus uh, and is a, a, a very, uh, I think, very moving and, uh, but also very, very funny play, a sort of uh, almost campus comedy with various serious overtones uh, to a play uh, that was produced here, uh, Boy Gets Girl, which I did not direct, again, which is set in the world of sort of um, journalism, uh, you know, on the Upper West Side of New York City and starts out as a play about a stalker, but I think is much more a play about gender and a woman's relationship in the workplace. And uh, I, 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 what I admire uh, about Rebecca is the way she can create a multitude of voices. Um, you know, her earliest play that I was familiar with, the play which was very much about poor people, about a serial killer, uh, in Alabama, a play called The Glory of Living, captured the despair of poverty. Uh, and other plays we've worked on have captured uh, a very specific voice of lower middle class Midwesterners. And, and I find that very unusual and very exhilarating uh, uh, to work on. So just as a playwright, uh, I've been drawn to her for the variety of her subjects, the passion of her subjects, uh, the multitude of voices uh, that she creates. And, and I should also say we have a lot of fun when we work together, <laughs> uh, which cannot be underestimated. If you're gonna be in a rehearsal room and you're gonna be working in previews for a long time, uh, it's fun to be able to laugh and, and to sort of dig in and sort of be able to talk honestly together and feel that you've built a working relationship. You know, when a play, it's a very complicated relationship between playwrights and directors. Um, because you have to collaborate. And, 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 and it's, it's clearly the, pl the playwright's play that you're presenting, but directors also generally have strong egos and strong points of view, and, and there can often, there's always going to be, and I think at its best, a creative tension between two people trying to do the best work. Uh, but sometimes it works better than other times. And I just feel very pleased to have been able to do these uh, four plays with Rebecca. So that's a, kind of a long answer to your question. No, and there's a lot there that I want to pick up on, but let's stay with this last point. Rebecca, what is the collaborative process like between the two of you as you come with a play, or maybe you come with an idea for a play? How does it work? Well, I, just the other night, um, Bob and I, after the show, he's giving me a ride home, and I said, you know, you put up with more shit from me than any other director I've ever worked with. <laughs> Sorry, pardon my French. <laughs> but what I, what I think is, what I love about our relationship, and the reason for that is, and this is true in the way that Bob works with actors, too, is that Bob completely respects and trusts the artist that he works with. And so while he's directing, he's also giving everyone freedom to invest authentically in what they're doing and bring any idea or any notion into the room. And there's never a sense of, always a sense of exploration. And 
I feel that he trusts me and respects me enough that I have the freedom to sometimes be a pain in the butt. Um, and I, I guess, I guess I always trust Bob's instincts, and I and I always find that we have the same questions, and that we're picking up on the same moments is not working, and that when Bob looks at the language of my plays, I know that he instinctively hears it the way that I do. So that even if an actor hasn't accessed something quite yet and isn't quite realizing it the way I hope that he or she will, I rarely even have to give the note to Bob. I know he's going to hear it too, and that he's probably at some point going to correct it if the actor doesn't do it first. But he always gives the actor the opportunity to do it first. So I think everyone feels that they own their work in his rehearsal room. And I don't, I, you know, I've worked with a lot of really wonderful directors and had terrific relationships with them. Um, but in terms of the way the two of us work together, I feel that it's, I, I just feel that there's just more, more room for exploration, more room for questioning, more room for insight. So, and I love the place that Bob directs. They're not my place so much. And, and what I think he always does is he takes the text and he realizes it, which is incredibly hard to do. You go, oh, he realized what's written on the page. People don't know just how hard that is. And then he brings another vision to whatever he's directing that's not a vision that's imposed. It's not like, oh, I came and I reconfigured this or I you know, took something that didn't work and jammed it on top. But he somehow finds another level of experience, another level of expression or visualization that wasn't on the page that again comes from some, I think, really terrific organic place and makes makes whatever it is really breathe and really be alive. So I just I just love his work. What are the conversations like as the two of you both decide that you're going to work on a particular play and as you go through the process of realizing it to the form now? What, 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 take us inside what you guys are doing. Are you meeting on a regular basis? You know, for coffee, is you're sort of putting the, the finishing pieces on it? Are you talking to Bob? Is it, I've got an idea for a play. Here's what I'm thinking. What happens there? When the good one's giving me commissions, the great thing about it is I say, go write a play, and, then, and that's it. So I just go and I write what I want. The only time that that wasn't true was Bob came to me with the idea of doing a modern day adaptation of A Doll's House. And a lot of people come to me with ideas for adaptations, and I don't always respond, but with that one, I really did. I thought it was a great idea. But then, I, that was it. He said, let's do it. And I went away, and I wrote the adaptation, and I brought it back. And so there was, you know, again, I was free to go and do whatever I wanted to do with it. Um, and then, but when we're working on other plays, we generally, we generally have the script in front of us, and that's when we start talking about it. There's often been, uh less so now than uh, in the past where we would have these conversations about what your ideas were and you might have two or three ideas that you were working on simultaneously and you might say this play I'm thinking about and then I have this play that I'm thinking about and I have this play that I'm thinking about and I'll say well we'll sort of have a conversation of questions and answers and try to if I can help hone in on what I think a play might be we sort of had a, it's, it's true, but we've talked about it often, that there have been times where Rebecca says, for example, well, I'm working on a play um, about uh, capitalism and baseball. <laughs> it's, it's about you know, baseball and, and money and, and the way players and owners, and it's about money and baseball. And the play turns out to be like 700 pages long, and you're still working on it. And then the next, you know, two weeks later, you'll come back with a completely new play that you wrote in four days. Uh, that that is a play that, in that particular case, was about sort of low-level massage parlor prostitution <laughs> and a young police officer. But it was actually ultimately about money and capitalism and the exchange of people in a profession. Um, and I and that's happened a couple of times where where you you. You know, the, the, the long uh, Louisa May Alcott family play uh, you worked on turned out to be what, ultimately? It that, bo turned out to be Boy, Boy Gets Girl. Boy Gets Girl. <laughs> so, so a play will, a, a seems, and I have no idea what's going on in your head, but that, yeah, how do you, you might want to tell me, you might want to tell us all right now how that happened. 
I, I get an idea and then I, and it's not always a good idea, but I, I'm very stubborn and I won't give up and I worry the same moment forever and then I write 700 bad pages and then somehow I figure it out. It's not a good working process. <laughs> I've gotten a little bit better. Yeah, I, think I, I, think I'm, I think I recognize the, the, the stupid path I'm taking earlier. And I <laughs> Before page 700. Yeah, yeah. But what happens generally is, you know, we'll have, it, it sort of depends on each play. Um, you know, this one was a little funny because I loved this play from the moment I read it. I really, really responded. And I thought it was really uh, quite complete. I mean, there have been some other plays we've worked on that were not as fully realized uh, in an early, early, er draft mm -hmm. that I have read. And this one I thought was very, very realized and had even had a workshop um, at another theater with another director and a full cast. And, and uh, what, what, what I have and what I like to do then is just have a series of questions where I'm trying to understand the play, where I feel I need to really sit down for a number of hours and just say, I don't really completely understand this. Uh, and it may be something as simple as, I don't understand where Tipton is uh, in Iowa and why Tipton. Or it's, I don't understand why a character is doing this at that moment. I, I, I'm pretty good at the psychology of human beings, but sometimes I just don't understand it and need clarification. Um, so th this was a case, for example, where I was very busy and Rebecca was very busy, and we actually met much later in the process than we normally would. But it usually involves one or two or maybe a couple of sessions where we just kind of go through the play together. And I will also be, uh, I, I will sometimes, now that we've worked together enough, uh, the word that I would say, which is a hard word, and it's hard for people in the theater, or maybe anybody in any form, jobs you have, is trust. You have to develop and earn trust. And, and one of the things I love about working with Rebecca is I think we trust each other enough that we can be honest with each other. And I will sometimes say, I don't get this at all, or I don't think this works, or I don't think this is good, even. And, 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 and that will lead to a discussion. And similarly, what I love about Rebecca is there are playwrights, quite frankly, who you don't really want in the rehearsal room. Uh, all playwrights should be in the rehearsal room, and all playwrights, that's that's the first right a playwright has when they create a play, is to be in the rehearsal room and to have approval over design and casting and collaborate with the director. But sometimes there are directors who are just not good with people. Uh, they may be great with words. Uh, playwrights, you mean. What's that? You said playwrights, you mean. That aren't playwrights, yeah, playwrights who are not good with people. What did I say, directors? Said directors. Well, there are actually a lot of directors who are not very good with people. Men need directors who are not very good with people either. <laughs> but, but there are some playwrights whose just energy just doesn't fit uh, the working relationship in a room, and it's almost better if they're not around. And with Rebecca, similarly, I think she has a great ability to talk to actors and communicate with actors, and also to say to me, the same way I can say, I'm not sure if this scene works on paper, she can say, I don't know if this scene is working on its feet. And, and that may very well be my work. You know, or probably is at that point, something I am doing to misinterpret or to cloud in some way the intentions that Rebecca has. Let's talk a little bit more about Luna Gale. This is, uh, you've talked a lot in other contexts about the inspiration for this piece, which comes from the PBS Frontline documentary. I think the title of it is Failure to Protect. Um, and I would love for you to talk as much about that particular piece and how it connects uh, as you feel comfortable in it. But I'm curious to know, you're watching this documentary, what was it that struck you about the story that unfolded and made you think there might be something here to explore? I was struck it was a documentary about um, social workers in the state of Maine and there were multiple cases that they were working on. And I was struck by a couple of things. One thing I was struck by was there was one case where a woman um, had a live-in boyfriend and her daughter had accused or said that the live-in boyfriend was sexually abusing her and the woman didn't believe that her boyfriend was doing that and um, basically the social workers laid out a series of things she would have to do in order to keep the custody of her daughter and her other two children 
and I felt that when I was watching it that I didn't know if I believed the daughter and I felt that the social workers were bullying this woman and that they were taking a sort of um, a sort of patronizing tone towards her maybe because of her class and because of maybe education and I was sort of blown away by the amount of power they had over this person's life and then at the end of the documentary it turned out that they were absolutely right and that their gut instincts about what had been happening in the house were all true were all accurate and I thought wow if you've been observing dysfunction familial dysfunction for that many years you probably kind of come to know even if you can't prove things and the other thing I was struck by was that there was a panel discussion at the end of the program and there were a lot of policy people talking about the ways in which the child welfare system works and somebody made the point that this is the only real um, sort of broad system that the government has in place in our country to deal with poverty and that by the time you get into the child welfare system or the foster care system every other social safety net has broken for you and has failed you mm -hmm. and you're in a moment of crisis that's really hard to get out of and that rich people never have this happen to them rich people may have similarly equally dysfunctional families in which people are sexually abusing their kids or abusing or whatever but they don't end up with social workers at their door because they have a variety of other ways to address the problems so that's what struck, struck me about that documentary what, what did you do we should maybe i should pause here to say for those who aren't fully aware so this is a play that takes place um, in contemporary times. It's set in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Um, as we open on Luna Gale, we see um, a couple. They are uh, in a waiting room, uh, waiting for their daughter, Luna Gale. Um, they're using meth, um, and a social worker sort of comes in now to begin a conversation which really propels the action in motion and all of the themes that, that come into it. Um, the setting, the scenery, uh, set design, the, the, this is a land of, of quick trips and come and goes. <laughs> uh, those places that if you spend any time in the rural Midwest, you, you've come to encounter them in small towns and highways. What did you do to, to research these worlds of, of meth users and social workers and the rural Midwest to try and bring this to life? Well, I lived in Cedar Rapids, or I lived in Iowa City, and I taught in Cedar Rapids for about six years, so that came naturally to me. Um, and then my uh, sister, when I was living in Iowa, was training to do a family counseling, and she had shadowed a social worker and gone on family or home visits with her and had told me some stories that, and this was 25 years ago, but they had really lodged in my head, and it was what had struck me about those stories was the amount of mile, the, the distance that was covered, the amount of time spent driving from home to home, going into somebody else's home and judging somebody else's life in their house from a quick visit. And I, you know, I thought if you put yourself in that situation, if somebody came into my house this afternoon, what would they think? You know, I, 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 took, I put the garbage up in a bag, but I stuck it by the back door because it's too cold. I didn't want to take it outside. Am I gonna, is a social worker gonna write me up for that because I have garbage in my house? And so those were the sorts of things she said, you know, if you go into a house and your first impressions um, are not always accurate, but the social worker has to make decisions based on this small amount of material. And then I just did, I did the meth, Addicts came from, I sprained my ankle in Oregon, and I went to an emergency room in Eugene, and I was in this little room with these, this, these kids who were meth addicts, this couple. And um, they were, the guy was passed out, and the young woman was all hyped up, talking to her drug dealer on the phone. And then her phone rang, and it was someone who was calling her to ask her some question about their kids. It was like their babysitter, or, or her mother, I thought, who was taking care of their children. And I was like, wow, you have kids. And then she suddenly became very competent on the phone, gave very clear instructions to the whoever it was about what time the baby should be fed, when the baby should be put down, and there was you know formula in the refrigerator and how to heat it up and everything. And I was like, well, are you a good mother, even though you're a crazy meth addict? You know? So that sort of propelled the story of the play. And unfortunately, it's really easy to find a lot of information on meth. 
But um, there's a really great book called Meth Land that I read about the meth epidemic in Iowa, too. And, and Bob, you and I have talked a number of times in the past about the kind of research you do before moving into a production, the way you actually you know, fill the, the box literally and figuratively with ideas and photos and riffs and things that might help you think about how to realize this. What were you turning to to think about how this play should be realized on stage? Well, I was working, you know, I always work with an extraordinary group of designers, and sometimes they're the same designers, sometimes they're different, but it's a very close relationship I'll have um, very early. I start very early in terms of researching, which means gathering photographs uh, and listening to music and just uh, pulling together documentary sources. I mean, this was a little bit unusual for me because I, I don't do that many plays that are actually set completely in the contemporary world. Uh, you know, usually I'm doing, you know, uh, Measure for Measure, for example, is the last play I did, which was simultaneously for me about, uh, you know, 17th century London and 1970s New York. So this is the rehearsal room, actually, and no matter if it's that play or this play, we fill that whole back wall behind you. You can actually almost see, you know, some with photographs and images and newspaper articles. We, we just sort of fill it uh, with, with visual images. And in this world, uh, it was a play of institutional mazes. Uh, it, it was a play about people who get caught up in, in environments under fluorescent lights. The scenes take place in offices. They take place in the basement waiting rooms and court rooms with Coke machines and vending machines. Uh, it takes place in sort of a, a sort of crappy playroom where where social workers are able to look behind mirrors and see how how adults or you know, parents are interacting with children, uh, and and so you start to develop a sense of the world with the designers, and, and and in this case it was trying to make a very very real world and a very very real honest world, um, and 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 so you just sort of gather lots and lots and lots of information, and then I work with the cast in an extremely detailed way uh, on exploring the world of the play uh, in terms of creating character biographies, uh, in terms of having them bring research. It's not all about me actually as much as encouraging the cast. We'll get assignments, you know, we'll say to the two actors who are playing uh, meth addicts to bring in, uh, you know, like a half hour, 45 minute presentation about what they've learned about meth or to ask people to bring in, um, the, the, several of the characters in this play are fundamentalist Christians. Um, it's, it's sort of sketchy in the play, it's never really laid out the specific church that it might be, but we ask those actors to do a great deal of research themselves on fundamental, fundamentalist Christianity and to sort of bring it in for discussion. So a lot of the rehearsal, uh, is, is sort of discussion-based and research-based and sort of building the world of the play visually as well as historically uh, and specifically for the actors. So, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that one great thing about the research that you cast did this time was the um, Jordan Baker who plays Cindy. She did the re research on what hospital her character might work at in Cedar Rapids. I had, didn't think about it. She came in and she talked about the two hospitals and she picked a hospital. She thought it was the right one. It was near the house where she thought she would live. And then I had to do a rewrite on the second scene of the play. And I went, well, she works. I knew where she worked. And it, it's now in the play that she works at St. Luke's Hospital, that her daughter took the baby to Mercy Hospital. And there, there was, some, there was it turned out, this child protection center at St. Luke's Hospital in Cedar Rapids. And I was able to use that. So their research ended up informing the text of the play, which is really great. So we have this world of, of meth addicts, we have this world of kind of the, the child welfare system, the social worker, and we have this other world that you just alluded to, Bob, with um, evangelical Christians, fundamentalist Christians. Um, faith in that context, but I would argue that faith in other contexts, faith, faith in the system working out, faith in somebody making the right decision and taking the, a, a fork in the road that would lead them to a healthier life, is, is all part of this play, too. Um, how do you think about faith in this play and the role that, that it plays in, in our understanding of the motivations and the, the risks and the way people 
sort of encounter the challenges that, that life is throwing at them on a gale. I guess I, was, I looked at all the characters as having um, a great need for something that would give them comfort and hope. And I sort of went character by character and asked what is available to them and what have they turned to. And with the young people, they turn to drugs. And with the three um, characters who are evangelical Christians, they turn, turn to their God. So it sort of leaves Caroline in the place, and since she's the protagonist, my question was, you know, where does Caroline put her faith? And she happens to be at a moment in her life where faith in everything she's worked for and everything she's been doing and her own power to make a positive change in the world are really being sort of incredibly challenged and deeply questioned. So that for me is the open question of the play is, is where, where can Caroline find faith or where would she put her faith? So tell us more about Caroline. How would you describe her? She's a social worker who has 25 years worth of case experience. She's a case worker for 25 years, which is unusual, which says to me like she's incredibly dedicated to her job. Um, and I think she's really incredibly smart and competent and she cares, but she's also completely burned out and at a place where she doesn't know if she can affect positive change anymore. And she's very um, guarded, I think. Um, so I think part of the, the journey of the play is finding out who she is um, without her telling us, I don't know yeah. how to put it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think that that's part of the play, of course. You, you know, when, it goes back to my first statement that, you know, Rebecca clearly writes this extremely well-researched uh, uh, world of, of the economic world of these characters and the social system, very much so in this play. Uh, but then, it's very much about real people, very complex human beings. And one of the things I love about Rebecca's work is that she gives voice and dignity to a variety of people in the conflict. And certainly our hope is that the audience is constantly sort of off guard on who you might identify with. That, that you know, you might think our protagonist uh, uh, as is usual, is the hero of the piece, but the protagonist in this play, as in most of Rebecca's plays, end up making some terrible decisions often, as human beings do. Uh, I don't think there are any villains in this piece. I think that the people, people believe in what they believe. People are passionate about what they believe in. Uh, these people are human. They're surviving. Uh, all of the people in this play are, are really struggling in many ways, with the issues of faith. I think they're struggling economically. They're, they're struggling in our current world just to keep their heads above water. Uh, you know, uh, and, 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 and I think that that's, you know, we, we, the, there's a very, very strong plot in this play where you get very involved with the conflicts between these people. And, you know, we may start out thinking we know who two teenage meth addicts are, and we may be very judgmental of them. Uh, and then we sort of learn that they're quite different than you might think they are, but yet certainly not heroic in any way, uh, still very, very complex. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I always use the word morality or moral in Rebecca's work, but it's a very moral universe where she's really trying to give dignity to human beings in a very complicated situation and making very complicated moral decisions about, about things. You have an uncanny ability for this. I mean, in, in your other work, I have to think about spinning it about her, um, Blue Search, you, to turn the, keep turning the prism. And so you see the motivations and the action of the play through the eyes of each character in ways that, that give that person uh, a more of a three-dimensional characterization. It's, I mean, that's one of the things I love about your work. Where does that sensibility come from for you as a person, as a playwright? The ability to sort of try and understand and give some dignity to every player involved. Well, thank you. First of all, it's very sweet. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, I guess. Um, Is that I, an upbringing thing? I, you know, it may very well be. I mean, I... I mean, if you want to be a playwright, one of the or one of the joys of being a playwright is that you get to write from every character's point of view. And I feel like if you're not fully inhabiting every character's point of view, then you're you're giving short shrift to somebody on stage. And you know, I never want to do that. Um, 
I did, you know, I grew up in Alabama and my mom was a Southern Baptist, my dad was a Jew from Boston, and it may be that that put me in a position of not exactly knowing where I fit in and maybe observing a little bit more than participating, so that might be it. And I had sort of ambiguous class origins as well. We were in a very small town, probably the most well-off people in our small town. But then as soon as I started going to a school in Birmingham, Alabama, which was much larger, I was suddenly the poorest person in, you know, in my school. And so um, I think it may, it may be that, that that sort of ambiguity has made me, but I don't know. I don't feel like I can lay claim to any particular like superpower or anything. All of that, though, brings to mind something else, which, which my wife and I spent some time talking about after the play last night. Um, and I'd be curious to know what the conversations you had about this. So, um, oftentimes when we talk about one of the central questions in this play, which is underlying all of this, is sort of the fate of the baby and, and who makes a good parent. That's one of the central questions here. What is good parenting? Um, when this surfaces in broader society, often it's somebody's reaction to a news story or something they observe somebody else or the neighbor. And often it's sort of filtered through a very obvious class, race, or ethnic prism, sometimes a religious prism as well. In this play, though, we're talking about uh, everybody in the play, with one exception, is from the same uh, race, from arguably, I think, the same class. There might be some subtle differences there. So we're all playing on roughly the same. You've, you've sort of removed these other variables that might affect one's perception, the mm -hmm. cultural relevance of them. How conscious of a decision was that in either the writing or the casting or, or the, the talk as you produce this play? I think that's a, that's a good question. I think that for me, I, I, um, I knew that I wanted, you know, I, I don't know that I consciously thought about removing filters that would affect people's judgment in that way. I sort of, I knew, I knew from way back the world I wanted to write about. And, and, you know, I made it sound simple, like, oh, I saw a documentary and then I sprained my ankle and I wrote this play. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I've been working on this play on and off for probably nine years. So, really? so yeah, so it, it was originally a play called Snake Tank just to go back to the things you've never seen. You're probably really happy you never had to see them. I like the title, though, for another play. Yeah. <laughs> and it was really bad. But, um, so I sort of have always known that it would be in Iowa, and that, I don't know why I've always known that, but I just knew, knew that it would. And Iowa is in, you know, Iowa is Iowa. Um, so there's a, there's a um, homogenous, right. more homogenous population there. So I'm not but, really answering your question. But, but you yeah. do, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of picking up a little yeah. bit on what Steve said, that I think that one of the things that distinguishes your plays, and I think your writing, is a very distinct class consciousness, that you are writing generally about people who are voiceless at times. I mean, there are other plays where people are very, very articulate, in, even in a hyper-articulate world. But it seems to me that you, I don't think it's any accident, for example, that for a number of years, Rebecca was affiliated not only with the Goodman, but with the Royal Court Theater in London, which has always been one of the more politically conscious theaters, uh, if not the single most politically conscious theater in the English-speaking world. You know, the play that began John Osborne's career and Carol Churchill and a lot of what people would call political writers. And I think that, Political writing is is almost a no-no today. You know, it's, people use that phrase, and it sounds very negative, as if you're writing uh, in a polemic or a way. But one of the things that I admire about Rebecca, and I think underlines uh, your humanity, is an identification with characters who are often, um, you know, of of what some whatever whatever someone might say, a lower class or or underprivileged people. Or in many ways, just you know, dignity to the voices of people who live here in the Midwest, you know, as opposed to every play you see, which takes place in rather expensive New York apartments, dealing with people on the Upper West Side, 
which seems to make up about 90% of the new plays that I read, <laughs> you know? And a play that Steve referred to that I, I loved, a play called Blue Surge, which was about, you know, what happens when a, a, a young police officer meets a massage parlor worker in a, in a place, we never quite defined it, like Kenosha, Wisconsin, or, or Aurora, yeah. or something. You know, starts out seeming to be a play about sex, but is a play about class, is a play about economics. Uh, and, and, and I think that sort of, there's a sort of uh, humanism and, and secularism that, that, that underlines a lot of your work, which I think is rather unusual. Let's take questions from those of you. So um, if you do have a question for Bob or Rebecca, we just ask that you come up to the microphone so we can capture you both audio and visually on uh, the stream. Yes, go ahead and step on up to the microphone if you don't My question is, did you want to have this play premiere in the Midwest, like Chicago specifically? Was the location important to you? Um, I, I did, and I, um, it's funny, I, I also, I have a play that's opening in St. Louis in March, and I really, it's set in Wisconsin, and I'm really happy that it's opening in St. Louis, and I really want to see it done in Wisconsin. Um, I, I love Chicago, I love theater in Chicago, and I love working with the Goodman, so um, that was my first choice, for sure, and I was very delighted, and I was very delighted that he wanted to direct it. <laughs> what other questions do you have? Don't be shy. Actually, taking some questions via Twitter, and so I have one from someone on Twitter that asks. His name's Kevin Hool, and he was asking um, Bob and Rebecca, "Have you ever had any um, <clears throat> disagreements that you were unable to resolve about staging or text?" <laughs> good question. It's a good question. I can't think of any offhand. What usually happens is Bob says something to me, and I get really stubborn, and I'm like, "No, it's great. I don't know why you're saying that." <laughs> and then I go away, and I go. Oh, he's right. And then I feel really chagrined, and then I fix it, and then I come back, and the thing I did is tons better than what it was before. And then everybody's like, "That's really good." And then I go, "Well, do I give Bob credit, or do I just take credit for having seen that problem myself?" And then I usually go, "Bob was right." Well, you're being very nice. That's not always the case. Trust me. I mean, I, you know, it's it's part of it is for me. It's just I try to throw out a lot of thoughts. And, and the idea is to say, you know, all I can do is say, here's a couple things I think, and, and, and hopefully not hammering too badly. Sometimes, actually, as a director, I, we, we have this conversation almost every night. You're sort of, I'm sorry if I'm being a pill, and I'm like, I'm sorry if I'm being a bully. <laughs> so that conversation comes up, but it's, it's a good question because I can't think of one right off the bat, and, and Usually that is the case. I mean, if you're going to collaborate generally, you just don't want to carry a grudge around for the rest of the yeah. production. You know, I mean, you know, one of the one of the better instances of that is the process of casting, which is a very complex. And we've been on the verge of that every once in a while, yeah, yeah. where casting is very very complicated, and and it means that we'll see a bunch of actors for any given part, and I may respond stronger to a particular actor than Rebecca may, but I'm not going to push that actor unless Rebecca feels strong enough about that actor. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we'll have to have a discussion or maybe try to talk each other. It, it's always great when it's just a given. You see an actor and you go, great. But there are often cases where, you know, she sees the character. It, it took me a long time, actually, in this play, if you've seen it, to understand Pastor Jay, who's, who's uh, the pastor who appears in the play of, of Cindy's pastor. And I just did not have an image for that person. I just did not understand enough about an evangelical church. Uh, I just couldn't see it. And, and Cindy's we, the grandmother of Luna Gale. Yeah, Cindy is, Cindy is the grandmother of Luna Gale, and, and it becomes ultimately a battle in the play between uh, Caroline, who generally is advocating for these two young recovering addicts for most of the play, don't, really. Don't spoil any. Huh? Don't spoil anything. Oh, that's not spoiling. Okay. <laughs> that's spoiling? There's still a lot of twists. Right, okay. There's just still a lot of them. And, and to say that 
it's, there's stuff going on. But, <laughs> but Pastor Jay is a very strong advocate for the grandmother of this baby. And I just have no idea how to go with it. And it took a while for the two of us to arrive at who we think is the perfect choice. But I think that's an example more. And mm -hmm. although I also know that we've never left the rehearsal room going, it, that would just be awful, you know, if, if, if I really said, I have to have this actor, and Rebecca never really believed in that actor, I don't think we could continue very well. No, that's never happened. And I will say that if it comes down to it, and I, Bob has some note or suggestion, and I say that's not how I see it, or that's not what I want to do, he, because it's, he knows it's my right. text, so. Well, and yeah. I should also always say that. I mean, we're making it sound like a collaboration. And certainly the putting a play together is a collaboration, but it's really about Rebecca's play. It's about any playwright's play. Uh, you know, sometimes I will take far more uh, interpretive, uh, liberties is the wrong word, because I think I'm trying to come, if I work on a measure for measure or King Lear, I'm trying to bring what I believe Shakespeare was trying to do in that particular play, and it may get filtered very specifically through my perspective. But when I'm working on a new play with a writer, it's the writer's play. And, and even though I may ultimately say, you know, I don't think this is a broad sense and we never have this. If I were to say, I don't think this scene works. And Rebecca says, well, I feel very comfortable and happy with the scene. That's the way it is. You know, it's, it's Rebecca's scene. Uh, and again, I've never really ever felt that a scene hasn't worked that we've worked on. And I would but, never not listen to you if you right. said that you didn't think it would. But, but yeah. so you work together, but it is, and I think that's important for people who don't realize that. It is the playwright's work, and particularly when you are presenting a play for the very first time, which is a very, very important thing. Uh, it's, 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 it's truly the director's responsibility to the playwright to give them the best possible production. Uh, to what extent do you visualize the characters in your own mind as you're in the act of writing and visualize what this world looks like. Do you mean physically? Or? Yeah, yeah, just in your own mind, you sort of, you, you're starting to shape it out and you know, does that I, create problems? I don't ever, I think early on maybe I might have had notions of what the people look like, but the first time you have a, a set of, an audition for a play, you realize that that's not a consideration. You're looking for the best actor and unless it's three tall women and you literally need tall women, you know, you're, you're not ever going to cast based on appearance. Um, normally when I'm writing, I don't, um, I don't see the characters. I am looking at what's happening from their point of view. So you're looking out through I'm their looking eyes. out through their eyes. So I don't really, nor, I don't think too much about what they look like. That's really interesting. Um, what other questions do you have? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the name Luna Gale and the picture there, uh, what does all that mean metaphorically? You know, um, I would love to say something really brilliant here, but it doesn't really mean anything. I thought about why, I thought about these two kids and, and, um, and why, what they might name their child, and there's the, um, children's book Stella Luna about the bat and I thought that they probably really loved that book so they named her Luna after that and Gail just sounded good I guess but it, um, Bob really loved the name and it, and it originally the play originally had another title which was The Disregarded um, which is from a Seamus Heaney poem that really informed the matter. Well, I'd love for you me. to read that. I, it, it's, it's a wonderful poem and, and, and it's a wonderful you, you do understand where the title, uh, The Disregarded, comes in relationship to that play. Could you just do the last stanza? Of that? The poem is called Mint, and it's about, um, it's about a family that has a... Seamus Heaney's family, I'm assuming. But anyway, it's about this clump of mint that grows at their house that looks like weeds, but the, they cut every Sunday. And um, so it, the mint also spells promise and newness in the backyard of their life. But the last stanza is, um, let the smells of mint go heady and defenseless, like inmates liberated in that yard, like the disregarded ones we turned against because we'd failed them by our disregard. And I felt like that last bit thematically for me and for but it wasn't a great title for a play. So, um, so Bob and I had a long discussion about it. 
and he just felt like the the baby was the. I thought Looney Gale Looney was Gale a beautiful. Was, I think it'd be an entirely different thing if the play was called like Laura Jensen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, well, you know, it's just a perfectly lovely name for any Laura Jensen's out there. But I thought there was something very beautiful and mysterious about the name Luna Gale, uh, and that it didn't necessarily instantly say name of a child, which I thought gave it a sort of mystery. And I sort of loved the image because, of course, that child never appears in the play. The baby is six months old, and. Uh, the baby sort of makes an appearance in the play, although you actually never see the child, and the child is, is, is not really heard from. But I, I just thought it was a very beautiful and mysterious uh, uh, name for a play. And that image, I think, kind of speaks well of it. We have a hand up over here. Yes. I'll have you come forward to the microphone, if you don't mind, as we come forward. And then once she asks a question, too, we can take a few more questions here. I also wanted to spend a moment asking about it two other characters we haven't referenced yet, so we'll save that for a second. Yes, ma'am. I just want to make a statement because I really appreciated this play. Social work plays such an important part in all our environment. This was about a child, but my father had a social worker enter his small, small town in Iowa, except it was Wisconsin, and in three minutes tried to find that he was mentally incompetent to drag him from this country home that he loved. So I think we all need to be advocates for, for seniors and for children, and, and this play was very meaningful, and I sure thank you for it. Oh, thank you. What, what do you hope that, um, the, 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 this is always, I think, a question that, that writers and others sort of recoil from at some level, but you, you've, you've done a play about a very, very important issue in society, one that's often um, not in the full frontal view of the population as a whole. What, what, what do you hope a play like this sort of um, puts into the discourse for either of you? I guess, I mean, broadly speaking for me, I don't want to tell people what to think about the characters or the play itself, but um, broadly thinking, you know, I, broadly speaking, I think that um, there are a lot of people who, going back to the poem, in our world who we disregard, who we simply don't see. And um, I would hope that, I would hope that the play would spark people to think about their responsibility in the world that we live in to essentially take care of each other, take better care of each other. Um, and I, I work with a couple of organizations that um, really pay attention to people who are um, economically, you know, the bottom of the economic ladder and are sort of falling through the cracks. And that's the night ministry that um, gives free medical care and food to 5,000 homeless people in, the, in Chicago, and then they run shelters. As well. um, and they're, you know, they're, these organizations are out there. And the other is the ACLU, which right now has a sort of curatorial role or custodial role rather over the Department of Child and, and uh, Human Services here in, here in the state of Illinois because the kids in the foster care were um, not being kept safe the way that they should. So these are the kind of organizations that will file class action suits on behalf of people that I think we don't even think about their existence. Um, so I think there are, I think there are tangible ways that you can, you can help people even if you personally don't feel like you can go out and you know save the world or save the children or whatever. I think there are organizations in place that deserve our support. And I didn't mean for that to turn into a public service announcement. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you asked. So, yeah. Let's take uh, one other or two other questions here. Yes. Hi. I haven't had the pleasure of uh, experiencing your other plays, but I'm very curious, and I'm, we're going to see this uh, uh, this coming Sunday. Hi. And uh, but I'm curious about your previous plays and is judgment and religiosity does it always come up this way or was it is it special in this case? I don't. It's not in my other works. I, I think it came back to that essential question I started with, which is like where do we put our faith? And so that's why it's important this play. 
but more than anything else I've written. Yeah. Thank you. And let's take another question. Anybody over here? I have another. Yes, let's do another social media question. <laughs> uh, Eunice asks, uh, she would love to hear um, your thoughts on the parallels between religion and drugs as placeholders for self-fulfillment. That's a great question. Um, when I was doing some research for the play, um, because sometimes I'm really stuck as a writer, and so you Google things to pretend that you're working or pretend that you're writing. I Googled the phrase meth and Jesus to see what would come up. And um, what came up was a, a map, a, a map of stereotypes of the world in which they divided all of the world into, and then they would put a label. So in the United States, like the West Coast said something like, Republicans and pot smokers or something. It was something like that. And the entire Midwest was this big pink section and it said meth and Jesus. And that was the stereotype map for the Midwest. And I thought, well, someone out there has been making a connection that I, I think intuitively I was making. And, and you know, I, I think that I was trying to look at, again, where we find our sense of worth or where we find comfort in the world. And sometimes I think that the two seem like equally viable opportunities or equally viable solutions to people. Bob, let me close with um, a version of a question I just posed to Rebecca a minute ago um, about the unique role that theater can play as an art form in bringing to life um, complicated and important social issues. You know, Rebecca talked about the documentary that inspired her to begin down this path. My colleagues, former colleagues at WBEZ and the Sun-Times have been writing a lot about recent issues inside DCFS, but what does theater as an art form, uh, as, as an experience, have to play in the public conversation? Well, that, that too is a great question, and one I struggle with all the time in the selection of plays. Um, you know, I mean, I think the very best plays are essentially politically based uh, or you know and that can take place even in a family play a play like long day's journey tonight is in many ways about capitalism it's about you know it's about capitalism and it's about religion and it's about many things uh, and so i mean the greatest experience i have in the theater uh, is when audiences come out arguing about a play and sometimes they're arguing directly with me uh, <laughs> or they're arguing with each other before they go to dinner. And what is completely depressing to me is when they come out uh, not talking about anything other than <laughs> where they want to go to dinner. <laughs> uh, you know, because I think that the theater, more than any other form, should engage you in conversation. I mean, I think that what makes the theater exciting is that you are in the presence of people. And you know, I could go on and on. I mean, that there is a sort of sense of of, of, of coming together, uh, you know, in whatever social world, you know, it, it could be a church or it could be some sort of meeting or it could be some gathering to have a conversation that is important. So I firmly believe that the plays that I like the most are the ones, and I think they're essential. I think the theater should be a forum. I mean, I once heard a quote, and I don't know who it was from, it was attributed actually to a, uh, a director I know named Peter Sellers, who always said that being awake in the theater is always good practice for being awake in the world. And, and, and I think that's actually pretty accurate. Well, this play gives us much to think about, much to talk about in the days and months ahead. I want to thank Bob Falls and Rebecca Gilman for Luna Gale. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And thank you all very much for being here. I hope you enjoy the performance for those who are headed that way, and be safe getting home today. Thanks again.